Last time, we had the full geometric picture of what the roots of unity are in the complex plane. All endpoints spaced evenly around that circle of radius 1 around the origin. Anchored at the point 1, because 1 is always a root of itself. And then we ended up with the question of, okay, we know that these points have a certain angle and a certain magnitude, but can we find their horizontal and vertical components? Can we find how far over and how far up these points are? Can we find, in other words, their real and imaginary parts? Now, in a lot of circumstances, there might not be a need to, because we know how these points behave in terms of geometry, in terms of their arithmetic. And so unless there's a specific reason to find their real and imaginary parts, I would say we shouldn't feel compelled, but sometimes this need does come up. And so uh, we should do a little bit of that extra work to help figure out what those real and imaginary parts are. So we've already seen n equals 2, that's plus and minus 1, that are, that are square roots of, of 1. And we've seen n equals 4, where we get all the powers of i. So we skipped 3, so maybe we should look at 3 first. Figuring out these horizontal and, vi and vertical components, you're going to have to do it on an n by n basis. It's not the same for each one. So for z equals 1, again, we're going to have this picture here. We've got 1. We've got a circle with radius one, and then we need to divide that circle into three parts evenly to get our third roots of unity. So that's going to be like there, and it's going to be like there. And so since the full circle is two pi, and this is a third of it, this is two pi over three. And we could describe this as negative two pi over three. We could also describe it as positive four pi over three. And again, that's not the full description of the whole number that's the root of unity. That's just a description of the, the number's angle. So this number is known as zeta 3, and it has magnitude 1 and angle 2 pi. Over three. Now it turns out that if you remember your unit circle from trig, you can actually figure out what the horizontal and vertical components are for that point. Because if I draw it now without the circle, so here's the origin, here's the point, three. And if I look at that triangle, this is going to have a hypotenuse of one, this is going to be right angle there, and what I'm looking for are these horizontal and vertical components. And then if this is 2 pi over 3, then this is pi over 3. In other words, this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And I'll leave it at that. Maybe someday for an exercise, you can actually figure out what those x and those y are, and those are your vertical and horizontal components. So you don't feel super cheated. I'd like to show you one that's a little bit harder. What we're going to do is we're going to look at z to the fifth equals one, the fifth roots of unity. And I guess the benefit here is not just that it's a little bit harder, but that there's a couple other payoffs along the way. So um, we'll, we'll get to see a certain polynomial factoring that if you keep doing math is bound to come up over and over again. Um, and also just sort of see some neat tricks to figure out uh, what these horizontal and vertical components are. And in the end, well, there's sort of a surprise guest star at the end. So let's take a look at this. So this is going to give us um, a point zeta 5 that, like everything, has magnitude 1. And it's going to have angle equal to 2 pi over 5. Something that I mentioned but wasn't super clear about before is that if I think about what all these points are, so here's one, here's that, here's zeta 5. This one right here is another root of unity. This one right here is another root of unity. This one right there is another root of unity. And they make this pentagon that they're spread evenly around. Something that I didn't mention here is that we can think about this zeta 5 squared. And why is that? 
Well, again, remember, when you multiply complex numbers by themselves, so if I'm taking zeta 5 times zeta 5, its magnitude is going to be the magnitude of zeta 5 times the magnitude of zeta 5. And maybe you're getting a little bit bored of magnitudes because in this discussion, they're all just one. But then for the angles, we're going to get the angle and the other angle added together. And so it's 2 pi over 5 and 2 pi over 5, and that's 4 pi over 5. So this is zeta 5 squared. That makes this zeta 5 cubed. And that makes this zeta 5 to the fourth. It's also, if you think about it, zeta 5 to the minus 1. It's always tempting to go like sort of further into the Kabbalah of complex numbers because all of this stuff has so many facets in it and works out so perfectly with itself. It's what makes complex numbers really satisfying. There's one other bit of geometric symmetry that's worth noticing here. And that is that if you look at this point and that point, they're mirror images. So it's the same triangle with central angle of 2 pi over 5 just upside down. So in particular, and, th and this, there's nothing special about 5 here. There is something special about magnitude 1, because if you're thinking about a number and its inverse, the magnitudes are going to be reciprocals in the usual sense. So since here all the magnitudes are 1, reciprocals in the usual sense is just everything is magnitude 1. But the, the angle is going to be opposite. And then if you look in terms of vertical and horizontal components, they're going to have the same horizontal component, and they're going to have opposite vertical components. And this is going to be useful later. So I want you to keep this in the back of your mind, but I want to go now to this polynomial up here, and I want to do some factoring. So this polynomial up here, you want to factor it. It might be helpful to put it all, put everything on one side of the equation by itself. One of the things that we notice is that the, the one root we don't have to figure out the components for is one. So somehow, this should also be the same thing as z minus 1 times some other polynomial that gives me z minus 1 should factor out of z to the fifth minus 1. That gives us a new problem to try and figure out what that polynomial is. And we're looking at the polynomial, polynomial z to the fifth minus 1, and we wanted to know how to factor that specifically how to pull out z minus 1. And so we're at this question where we want to know what p of x can be. What is this polynomial? I know that it's got to be z to the fourth and some other stuff. And then it's going to have to have a 1. And why do I know that? Well, it's because if I'm going to multiply through by the z, I need to get a z to the fifth out. So there's got to be a z to the fourth in there to raise up in, in power. And then in the other way, I know that at the very end, I want to get a minus 1 here. So the only thing minus 1 can multiply by in a, in a polynomial and still stay a minus 1 is a plus 1. So this polynomial, p of x, is going to have to look at least a little bit like that. Now the problem is, well, at least like uh, in terms of imagining that I figured out this polynomial, is that I don't get to just multiply what I want. I have to multiply it through by everything. So that z is going to have to not only multiply by the z to the fourth, it's also going to have to multiply by the 1. So I'm going to get a z in there, but there's no z there. It's going to have to multiply by this other stuff that's presumably some other middle powers of z, somewhere between z to the fourth and 1, that'll raise up so that, uh, yeah. And then that minus 1 is also going to have to multiply by that z to the fourth. So I'm going to get a z to the fourth term there that's going to need to somehow go away. So I need to pick what this stuff is, not just so that it doesn't create its own problem and sort of end up in this polynomial, but also so that it gets rid of these, these sort of inconvenient bookends that we've got. The moral lesson I want to give here is let's just try something that might make sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give a look for this stuff. Let's just put a little bit of everything and see what happens. Let's say p of x is made up of all those pieces. Now, what's going to happen 
I multiply z minus 1 times p of x. Well, let's go ahead and multiply the z through. Each time when the z gets multiplied by one of those, it's going to raise its power. And now when I multiply the 1 through, it's just going to add a negative to each of those terms. And when I write it down, I'm going to line things up so we can see if something's going to cancel. So minus 1 times z to the fourth is minus z to the fourth. And sure enough, our totally naive guess is exactly p of x, because everything cancels. Besides having solved this problem that we sort of made up for ourselves, there's something structural that's worth noticing here, because it's going to come up again and again. z to the fourth plus z cubed plus z squared plus z plus 1. Sort of the simplest polynomial you can imagine making, as long as you throw in all the parts times z minus 1 equals z to the fifth minus 1. And this is true in general. z to the n minus 1 is equal to z minus 1 times z to the n minus 1 plus z to the n minus 2, on and on and on, until we get to 1. We can also write this another way that 1 plus z plus z squared plus z cubed on and on and on plus z to the n minus 1 is the same thing as z to the n minus 1 all over z minus 1. And for any of you who are in Cal 2 or have otherwise seen the geometric series, maybe this looks familiar to you. You also might be asking, all right, so if we did some polynomial factoring and we did some guessing, and where does that take us in terms of our original problem, which is to find the vertical and horizontal components of the fifth roots of unity? Well, the trick is that this polynomial here is now the one that those four other points of unity satisfy. So p of x here, remember z to the fifth minus one, is the product of z minus all of those roots. And if we take out the z minus 1 part, we have a polynomial that's solved by each of those other roots. And there's also a geometric way to see this. So let's consider just p of x and those fifth roots of unity and see how that works out in terms of the geometric picture. So this polynomial is solved by z equals zeta 5. If we plug in zeta 5, and why should we believe that? Well, maybe if we look back at the picture of these roots, remember we've got this circle, points spread evenly, totally symmetrically around that circle. In a fifth, Remember, this is zeta 5 squared. And because these are symmetric, if I add all of these points together with 1, they're all sort of pulling just as hard away as one another from the origin in mutually opposite directions. And so one way to think about that is that pull gets entirely canceled out. And so if I add all of these four numbers, these five numbers together, I will get zero. The net pull of all those directions being pulled away from each other is nothing. So that's another reason to believe that this polynomial is satisfied by these numbers geometrically. How does this actually help us figure out how far over and how high that is? Well, what we do is we exploit this relationship here. We know zeta to the 5 plus, or zeta 5 plus zeta 5 to the fourth power, that's going to equal twice our horizontal component. Because then this height cancels out with that height, and then this just gets doubled up if I add those two together. Um, I also know that another name for the zeta 5 to the fourth is, or, 1 over zeta 5. And so th this can also be seen as this equation here. Now, 
I can actually exploit this relationship within this polynomial that's here. So let's go back to this p of x and let's see if we can see z plus 1 over z in there somewhere. Now it's going to be harder to see if I've got such high powers, but one way to get back to the negative power so maybe it's easier to see is to multiply this whole thing through by 1 over z squared. The last thing I want to do is to ask the question, what do I get if I multiply z plus 1 over z times itself? I'm going to get z squared, and then the middle term, the z in the, on the top and the bottom are going to cancel out, so I'm going to get 2, and then I'm going to get 1 over z squared. And if I look up here, I can actually see z squared and 1 over z squared together. Now that's not a 1, or that is a 1 instead of a 2, but if I borrow against my future, I can actually see that my polynomial up here is the same thing as z squared plus 2 plus 1 over z squared, um, and then plus z plus 1 over z. And then to be fair about having a 2 there, I better take one away over there. And what's special about that? The equation that I originally took to be a quartic is actually a quadratic in the variable z plus 1 over z. So this function right here is z plus 1 over z squared plus z plus 1 over z, and then minus 1 equals 0. And our good friend, the quadratic formula, can help us solve that. We might be very used to solving for polynomials and then wanting to be able to actually figure out what z is, but z isn't really the question I'm after. The question I'm after is, what are these horizontal and vertical components? And the horizontal component is equal to zeta 5 plus 1 over zeta 5. Or, well, that's its double. And so if I divide this by 2, Whatever this turns out to be from solving the quadratic formula, that will be my horizontal component. So let's do that next. So zeta 5 plus 1 over zeta 5 equals twice the horizontal component that I want. And I know that the, the polynomial that this number solves has a quadratic in the variable z plus 1 over z. So I'm going to use the quadratic formula that z plus 1 over z is actually equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. So then this equals minus 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. And we ask again, in this situation, how many of these answers actually make sense for the problem that we're talking about? z plus 1 over z is a geometric construction. It is a positive number. And so it only makes sense to have the positive root here. So if I start out with the square root of 5, which is a number that's bigger than 2, and I take away 1, that's still a positive number. So I'm going to get rid of that negative there. I'm going to call this root 5 minus 1 over 2. So that is equal to twice the horizontal component. And so the horizontal component is equal to square root of 5 minus 1 over 4. If any of you have seen the hidden guess that's hiding here, this number right here, this is actually phi, or otherwise known as the golden ratio. And so this is pi over 2. If that's our zeta 5's horizontal component, so again, here's my complex plane. Let's say zeta 5 is somewhere out here. This magnitude of that number is 1. This distance right here is the square root of 5 minus 1 over 4. And then I will leave it up to you to figure out what that vertical component is. So zeta 5 plus 
1 over zeta 5. I've been calling this the horizontal component, but if I think about the angle here, that's 2 pi over 5, horizontal component is cosine. So this is twice the cosine of 2 pi over 5. And so what I've really found is the value for the cosine of 2 pi over 5. And if we don't care about you know, coming up with decimals, this form of description, that the horizontal component is the cosine of 2 pi over 5, would have worked all along, and I wouldn't have needed to go through this whole ghost chase. But how do you know what the cosine of 2 pi over 5 is? In this case, we can actually find a number that's a little bit more to our liking. So there's at least something nice there. But in general, for any n, if we're willing to accept trigonometric examples, zeta n is going to be the vertical part is going to, or the horizontal part is going to be cosine of 2 pi over n, and then the vertical part is just going to be sine of 2 pi over n. And that goes for any n. So we have a, a geometric description of what any of the nth roots of unity are. We have an uh, algebraic trigonometric description of what all those nth roots of unity are. And I hope along the way the complex plane has become something that feels a little bit more comfortable, um, or at least something that hangs together, something that's not arbitrary and, and sort of just there to give people trouble. Now, in another video, we can probably talk about things like, well, we could prove that the algebraic geometric rules for the complex numbers that I told you about, that multiplying numbers multiplies their magnitude and uh, multiplying numbers adds their angles. We could also look at this historically. We could say, who is it this figured this stuff out and why did it matter to them at all? I mean, I know I have this sort of a quasi-religious thing with the complex numbers, but there are specific places within the history of people asking mathematical questions that the question about what are the roots of unity and what kind of numbers are they has come up and it did matter. We also might ask if there is a general way to think about what those numbers actually end up being as numbers and how one might construct a, a table of, of, of trig functions of a, of a given angle, not just the nice ones that we know. We could also ask if any of the other ends actually give us nice, angle, nice angles where we do know the answer without having to do a general trigonometric to decimal conversion. But I think that's probably enough for one day. So I, I hope you uh, have, have begun to love the roots of unity as much as I have. And I certainly enjoyed getting to talk to, to you about it.